To many people, this represents the Cuyahoga River, the spot near downtown Cleveland where water from elsewhere flows into Lake Erie. That elsewhere is actually a 30 mile drive east of the mouth of the river to places like this, meandering streams that will one day form the river. It's a long navigation, 100 miles of alternating calm and turbulence to get to you from here and back to here. All of it formed by springs and glaciers in Geauga County back when the glacial era ended some 11,000 years ago. The era left us sometimes acidic waters when the glacier receded. Lakes from its retreat dot the region, from this small example at Kent State University, to far larger lakes that formed from deposits of ice in fully developed hollows, Aquila Lake near Burton being just one example. North flowing rivers blocked by ice turned south to escape, creating the meandering routes that permeate Northeast Ohio, especially the source water of what indigenous peoples would later dub the Crooked River. We headed out to talk to the expert on these lands, Geauga Park District's Dan Best. We have two branches of the Cuyahoga River, one in the eastern part of the uh, Geauga County, headwaters up here in Montville Township and comes down through Huntsburg and Clarendon. Comes down here and it meets uh, the west branch, which headwaters up here just uh, on the east side of Chardon. Where we are right now, Lake Aquila, is an example of a lake that was formed here by these glacial outwash deposits, uh, these sandstone hills. A lot of water moves through that Sharon conglomerate sandstone. It's very permeable and works its way into the valleys off the uplands. And that's what really is feeding the river. And we have some of these wetlands mixed in here too that uh, they're all part of that drainage system too. I don't really look to these like little lakes as feeding the river. They do to a small extent, but it, it's a general movement of water off the uplands into these old buried valleys here. <laughs> Ecologically, how important is this? Whatever happens up here impacts things downstream. Fortunately, our watersheds are fairly well protected up here um, by a variety of public lands and other preserved lands. People do come down and use this water quite a bit for fishing and for what else? Fishing to here, Lake Aquila, state wildlife area, yeah. Fishing, uh, just pleasure, boating. People come out in their kayaks, uh, canoes enjoy it, it's just a beautiful, these uh, glacial lakes that we have here in the Cuyahoga River watershed, just uh, the peaceful, tranquil experience of being out here, especially you come out, you know, at sunrise or, or sundown, and it's just a very relaxing, rejuvenating experience here. And that's why I think these lands are important. Talk to me about the, the bird life here. We have birds, we have, we've seen fox this morning. What other animals fox, would be in here? you would expect here. in here, of course, muskrat, beaver, um, quite possible that otter, we have river otter, well distributed throughout Geauga County here in the Headwater region. Keep coming, keep coming. They're coming right to us. Is this early in the year to see no, them? No, or no, no, they're here all yeah, all here year round. Oh, look at but that! Here, you said it's we're lucky to see this. If people can't come by and catch this often. No, here we are. We just show up and they and they just turned up here. People wait years for this <laughs> opportunity. Oh, yeah, he went down. As we can hear, this is the first place where the river comes into contact with people. Are they, are we doing damage to it right here by being so close to the marsh? Well, I, you know, any time you have a uh, river road crossing, you risk road salt. But if you have a chemical spill or something like that, overturned tanker truck or something like that, that's that's a risk too. And can be, uh, that can flow right into the river here. We're seeing the river flow through this marsh. What purpose does the marsh serve? It helps the health of the river, I gather. Oh, it does. Uh, wetlands are great for uh, kind of capturing a kind of a settling out capture area for any pollutants that might be here. And uh, it, groundwater recharge is a big important area. An area here kind of serves as a filter. A filter, yes, yes. Uh, filter for sediments and for pollutants here. So that wetland, that's one of the services that a wetland performs. 
This is Eldon Russell Park. It's one of the oldest parks in the Geauga Park District. It's one of the few, relatively few, access points for the upper Cuyahoga River. The best way to see the birds here is on the water. All right. Naturalist Dan Best has worked in Jaga County for more than 30 years. He estimates there's a couple hundred species of birds living in the region, at least for part of the year. I'm hearing them all around us, sort of warblers, vireos, uh, thrushes. Um, let's see, we will have cuckoos, we will. <laughs> Hummingbirds, Baltimore Orioles, rose-breasted grosbeaks, indigo buntings, uh, a whole, quite a number of the colorful warblers and flycatchers. There's one species in particular that's especially popular with birders at Eldon Russell Park. And I just heard our first prothonotary warbler of the season. The prothonotary warbler is a bright yellow bird and it's a swamp nester. On our canoe trip, we saw several of them looking for places to make a home. They actually um, prefer to be about five feet above the water. Thing is, is when they all go back in and find cavities, the cavities aren't necessarily at that height. They're often higher. And then when the water does recede, they're kind of maybe further than they want to be from the river. But once they're established, they're established. To give the prothonotary warblers a hand, Best places birdhouses all along the river. And we even have extenders to put on top here if the water gets really high. Best began putting out birdhouses in 1992 to prevent raccoons from getting to the nests. He says he's seen positive results until recently. With all the uh, high water events that we've had in recent years, even though these are wetland uh, trees, uh, they're getting too wet too often for too long and seems to be causing a die off in the silver maple, which is the main uh, tree in the swamp forest here. So far it hasn't affected the bird population too much, but um, what we're seeing is with the swamp habitat expanded across the, the floodplain here, the birds have much wider uh, choice and tend to go traditional on me with uh, woodpecker holes, abandoned woodpecker holes and knot holes as opposed to my bird houses. A lot has changed in the last 50 years along the river and Best says the conditions here are overall favorable for bird habitat. So there's been a great deal of, of reforestation and I think that, I mean there's always birds that do live in that open country and so forth and uh, there still are some open areas along the river and we, that adds to the diversity. But uh, I think with more forest uh, along here and uh, it's, it's such an undisturbed area, the, uh, it's a combination of private uh, property ownership along the river as well as City of Akron for their uh, water supply. What it all amounts to is you have a great deal of undeveloped wild land here. This quiet, picturesque spot on the Cuyahoga is much different from Wendy Park, another popular place for birding located where the river meets Lake Erie. It's a very urbanized area, but the connectivity between those areas is really important. It's important for fish, of course, uh, and for the fish diversity to be high, they need to come up and down the river, and a lot of the birds actually depend on that as well. Andy Jones is the curator of ornithology at Cleveland's Natural History Museum. So the merganser's back in the scope. On a morning bird walk, he pointed out various species from red-winged blackbirds to mergansers. In my spare time, especially in migration, I like to go out and see birds. Uh, that involves birding in Cleveland, especially right along the, the lakefront, uh, we have a nice combination of habitats with green spaces on the lake. On our bird walk, double-crested cormorants put on a show, cruising for breakfast and hanging out on the break wall. They started showing up here in the 80s in bigger numbers as the, the water itself improved. What kind of fish do they eat? Anything. <laughs> 50 years ago, it would have been rare to see a cormorant here, and now there's arguably too many of them. For a long time, the Lake Erie waters were really turbid, so it was hard for them to find prey. Uh, we didn't see many cormorants around, and then the water started improving thanks to quagga mussels, 
uh, and zebra mussels that were accidentally introduced to the lake. Those mussels are filter feeders. They cleaned up the water. They caused lots of other problems because they clog a lot of intakes and do a lot of other damage. But a side effect of them showing up is the water quality improved, the vegetation underwater improved, the fish stocks improved and were more visible, and then the cormorants took advantage of this. As habitat changes, birds often adapt, including the enduring population of gulls. While conditions have improved here since the infamous river fire in 1969, Jones says there are still many urban challenges for the birds. This is how cities are, are looking all over the world. We've got sort of this balance of some birds adapting to this new habitat. Um, and we have people working to help the birds out in these, these urban areas as well, but we're never going to completely uh, live in perfect harmony with birds. It, it's, it's necessary to have uh, active management uh, today. We have species that their continued existence really relies on human intervention. The biggest whitewater rapids in the Cuyahoga Falls race are right downtown in the shadow of the Sheridan Suites Hotel. Uh, the farthest person we've had travel by car is from Maine, maybe even Alabama. Uh, we did have a gentleman fly in from Washington State as well. Most of the old dams on the Cuyahoga were built to run mills. A couple generated electricity, but they haven't been actually working for decades. The idea of removing dams surfaced back in the mid-90s, but it was not about recreation. The Ohio EPA was studying the middle Cuyahoga between Kent and Cuyahoga Falls. They were trying to find out, after the big sources of pollution were cleaned up, why was the river not healthier? It was not meeting the standards for aquatic life, and um, most of the discharges in the area were pretty good. So um, they, they were wondering what was causing that, and the outcome of that study said that the major cause for aquatic life non-attainment, why the fish weren't healthy, was dams. And obviously stagnant water is never good. Uh, the sediment will drop out, which hurts the wildlife and all the breeding grounds, but also the water has to flow as nature intended to get oxygenated, so that was not happening. The Kent Dam was the first dam in the eastern United States that came out for water quality reasons, and it was the first dam in the state of Ohio that came out for other than safety reasons. So it was a new thing. Nobody knew what it was going to look like. A lot of people liked the old historic dam. There was a debate that lasted seven years. We soon found out that uh, Kent, being the unique town that it is, has a very strong environmental presence, but we also had a very strong historical presence. And a lot of people that have grown up in Kent their entire lives, uh, they spent a lot of time around the Kent Dam as kids, and uh, they didn't want to see anything change down here. So we learned very early on that there was going to be two opposing forces here, the historians versus the environmentalists. The battle went on until a compromise was reached. Leave some of the dam as a water park and open up a side channel to let the river run free. Before this project, the water level would have been about right here, about 14 foot uh, above the river itself and the water would be flowing over here. So when the dam pool was drained and, and this was, uh, park was added, uh, we got a lot more area for people to come down and visit and enjoy the area. The waterfall feature that uh, was so important to the citizens of Kent uh, had to be modified in order to keep some type of a waterfall. So what was done was there's actually a, a pump house built over there that has two 6,500 GPM pumps in it. With the dam pool gone and the river running free again, the water quality changed immediate difference. Um, it was pretty remarkable. We had our staff out there within six months to a year after the dam was, was removed. We did our uh, investigation into the biology of the former dam pool and showed that it was meeting our warm water criteria. Again, we, we had northern pike and smallmouth bass had, had come back to that dam pool that was di dominated by catfish and carp. Shortly after, downstream at about mile 50 on the 100-mile Cuyahoga, the Monroe Falls Dam was torn down with similar water improvements. Monroe Falls took a little longer. It's a different stretch of water, but uh, we most recently did our sampling in the Monroe Falls area, and it has 
it is also uh, meeting our water quality objectives. In 2013, the two dams within sight of each other in downtown Cuyahoga Falls came under the hammer. One was the Powerhouse Dam at the site of today's Burntwood Tavern. The second was near the Sheridan Hotel, where the restaurant Bows on the River juts out over the water to embrace the view. New bars and restaurants and breweries are being built on the river to take advantage of that view. There was a lot of public concern uh, about what would happen, what it would look like, what it would do to the aesthetics, what it would do to the historic values. And there were a lot of people who were concerned about this, especially people who lived near the river. But as the dams came down along the river, we saw that those fears did not come to fruition that instead of it impacting negatively the aesthetics and negatively their property, it was a positive asset. Prior to the dams coming down, we never really had a travel and tourism piece here. In fact, we don't have a travel and tourism director. I'll be that person. You know, it just keeps getting cleaner and cleaner. In the summertime when we run through here, um, you can see down six feet into some of, the, some of these areas very clearly. You can see all the way down to the river bottom. You can see fish swimming around, um, and it's, it's great. So it doesn't surprise me at all that there's so many new buildings being put up here to embrace the river. The next dam expected to go is the Canal Diversion Dam, or Brecksville Dam, in the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. It was originally built in 1827 to provide water for the Ohio Canal, but now all it does is back up two miles of stagnant water. It's scheduled to come down this fall. What that's going to get us is the dam pool above there does not meet our warm water criteria. And I would point out that, that below the dam pool, we are meeting exceptional warm water habitat, our criteria for the Cuyahoga River bo below that dam pool. That's the gold standard, the A+. Plus. That puts it on par with the Grand River and the Chagrin River. So we have no reason to expect that we're not going to have similar water quality improvements when we remove that dam. There is hope that um, a trout species would actually be able to go upstream into um, either Yellow Creek or Furnace Run and spawn. Um, there is a possibility that the Cuyahoga could become a trout stream. It's, it's going to allow fish passage also. Um, those low head dams, they're a safety hazard. Today, up and down the 88 mile stretch of the Cuyahoga, anglers have their favorite fishing holes. Should be a trail somewhere back here. Well, this is my spot just because this is where the river and the lake meet. Fishing the dam. There's a small tributary stream that flows into the Cuyahoga River called Mill Creek. Um, we're going to be fishing just downstream of the confluence of where it enters the uh, the river. By the lighthouse, it's real nice out there. This is like five minutes from my house. And they're catching fish. It's all kind of species you see in there. Five or six different uh, sucker species in here, smallmouth, largemouth, common carp. Perch, yellow perch, white perch. A lot of panfish, white perch. Actually, white perch was running like last week. Channel catfish, flathead catfish we're starting to see in here, which we never used to really see before, and they're starting to show up a little more in numbers. It's like almost every other cast I get a bite. And uh, if you're a fisherman, you know what I mean. Getting the bite on your rod, it's, it's like adrenaline rush. You're like so excited. I wait for the first bite of the year like you, won't, you don't even know. Recreational fishing along the river is quite a comeback for an ecosystem that 50 years ago was considered dead. Well, it was abysmal, and when rivers are burning, things cannot be good. So back then, we didn't see nearly the diversity of the bug community and the fish community that we see today. When you don't have a lot of diversity or numbers of food, right, you're not going to have fish. Fish need the bugs, they need the minnows too. So the food chain was highly disrupted. Highly polluted water bodies will not attract fish, certainly sport fish. Ridding the Cuyahoga River of pollution required an act of Congress. The fire of 1969 sparked government officials to pass the Clean Water Act of 1972 that called for all rivers throughout the United States to be safe enough for swimmers and aquatic life. We were going, you know, gangbusters with industry. Well, the regulation, there were certain regulations of the day 
but nothing as stringent as what exists today. And it wasn't until the Clean Water Act in 72 that the EPA as we know it today came into existence and the regulations as we know it today came into existence. So there was a lot of stuff going in the river and they used that river as a sewer. So the Clean Water Act is set up to make things fishable, swimmable, drinkable. So uh, the fish community meeting Ohio EPA's goal is meeting that it's fishable and that it's, it's, it's doing what it should be doing. To remove pollution, state and local agencies, including the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District, have engineered improvements along the river. They also monitor its condition through something called electroshocking. It's a 14-foot boat and it has, it's set up with a generator and electrodes that go into the water. So when we turn on the generator, it puts a current into the water uh, and it stuns the fish. So when we're netting the fish, we're putting them on the boat in a live well and we sort them by species and then we weigh them. So we count them and weigh them um, and then we use that information to determine the health of the river. Back in 2010 was the first time that we got walleye in the river um, and then a few years ago we started seeing the juvenile walleye that makes us think that maybe spawning is going on. So. Um, where we see lots of smallmouth, you know, other sport fish, and then anything down to minnows that everything else is eating. So they're all good signs. Anglers are seeing the results of the river's improvement through their own observations. I believe it's cleaned up to a most extent, and I see like fish populations moving up. Lake Erie is a good resource for the Cuyahoga River because most of the fish I see here come from Lake Erie. And I believe uh, they sustain themselves. I can see that happening. Seeing the birds around more and more, lets me know the river does have life because of course, you know, they fish just as well as us, sometimes better. <laughs> and uh, seeing the bird life and seeing more nature around here lets me know that the river is growing. Creek chirps, the shiners, the swallowtails, they all become like uh, food for the fish out here in the Cuyahoga River. Uh, I believe it's, it's healthy and uh, I'm very fortunate to enjoy this right now. Boy, I see the people checking on the lake and then you see the birds coming down here and the seagulls and they feed off the lakes and they be down here every year so it must be healthy because they come back every year to feed off uh, the fish in the lake. I see like wildlife, I see snakes, I see water snakes, I see what's happening in the nature. It uh, makes me reconnect with life. With the health of the river improving and the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency easing restrictions on fish consumption, more and more sports enthusiasts are enjoying the benefits of clean water. This is such a good resource now. I actually people harvest fish from here. And uh, even though I don't myself do it because I'm more of a sports fisherman. You should follow the uh, fish, fish advisories, fish consumption advisories, you know, and. Some people like eating a lot of fish. Some people just like to catch them and release them. I'm more of the catch and release type guy, and uh, um, but I'll eat a fish or two every now and then. I take them home, a whole lot of the people take them home, and uh, I ain't never got sick off of them or anything. And just like I said, I've been fishing down here for years. So I'm still healthy, so it's good to you know have the different kind of species of fish they got down here. It's, uh, well, it opens it up to, you know, not only the fishing, but the kayakers and canoe um, folks that like to utilize the river that way. To get outside and look from the outside of the city is motivating to be able to go back in and know what you got to do. And it's a thinking spot for me. This is like my, this is my piece right here. <laughs> While 300,000 customers receive their water from the Cuyahoga River for everyday uses, 92,000 of those are businesses. None use it more prominently than Akron's fledgling brewing industry. Jesse Dohler is the head brewer at R. Shea Brewing, which takes pride in using the Cuyahoga's water to create its signature products. Uh, water is a very important part of beer. It tells you if your beer is going to be soft, if it's going to be hard if it's going to be more pronounced on the malty side or it's going to play better with the bitterness of the, uh, the hops that you use. Uh, so water is very, very important and it's, you know, really cool to turn water into, you know, a sociable drink. <laughs> when you think about the Cuyahoga, the quality of the water, what does it do 
two or four of the beer that makes it special here that we wouldn't get in Toledo or Cincinnati. The water that we get at the Merriman Valley location is fantastic for uh, multier uh, beers. Uh, we don't really have to do anything to the water chemistry at all uh, because it already uh, sits very well uh, for the maltier uh, styles of beer. Other locations, they have to play with the, uh, the water chemistry, adding more minerals or salts to balance out of uh, what you want to create. But we're very lucky here. Uh, we don't have to add much to it to uh, make a good beer. You're talking about the fact that all the different brewers in Akron, you really do support each other. And that's one of the things you have in common. You want Akron to do well, but you want the water here to be known as water that's good quality. Because um, we're all making really, really good beer and it's becoming a destination for people to drink good beer. And it is uh, right down to the water that we use. How big can it get, the brewing industry in the city of Akron, in oh, Summit it, County? Um, it can definitely get a lot bigger. Uh, people feel like it's slowly getting saturated, but there's so much room for growth and uh, more innovation. Uh, so it's very exciting uh, to see in the next couple of years of um, who is going to be coming on and uh, who is going to be growing up. Um, so we're very excited to see that. What you do here. Is it rare or are there a lot of breweries that take the water as you do? It, it really depends on the brewer's take on uh, how they want to treat their beer. The water here is great for on the maltier side and it plays well for the styles that we brew. Um, there are certain styles that um, the uh, minerals uh, are a little bit too rough. It is a little rough of water. However, um, uh, some breweries like Hi Ho Brewing uh, they have a re uh, they use RO water, reverse osmosis, so it's completely stripped of everything, and then they're able to build up the water um, to the mineral content to be able to brew pilsners or kolsches, uh, certain styles that they need very, very soft, delicate water. And um, so there's two schools of thought. Uh, start with RO and then build up, just like you build up your recipe or work that you have and then slightly balance or just not brew the styles that your water can't do. And there's, there's no shame on either way because really you just want to brew a good beer. Thousands of people plan to gather in Cleveland tomorrow to mark the 50th anniversary of a fire that sparked a nationwide environmental movement. Besides the love of being on the water, Clevelanders have a newly rediscovered love of being around the water. This once nearly abandoned east bank of the flats, now every bit is revitalized as the river itself. New and refurbished apartment buildings line Old River Road, offering 24-7 views of the waterway. Nearly two dozen dining and entertainment options have opened, many with outdoor riverside patios. The Aloft Hotel boasts world-class accommodations for flats visitors. The six-year-old Ernst & Young Tower offers nearly a half million square feet of office space. And on the west bank of the Cuyahoga, Shooters offers a place where boaters can tie up while they grab dinner. For music fans of any genre, Jacob's Pavilion at Nautica helps keep the beat from Casey Musgraves to Alice Cooper. In all, there are 14 more outdoor shows scheduled at the water's edge before Labor Day. And to learn about the life in the river, the 70,000 square foot Greater Cleveland Aquarium sits just yards off the Cuyahoga. And what neighborhood is complete without a farmer's market? The Flats now offers that as well. But the Cuyahoga now stands poised for its next 50 years to be its best 50 years. Business and recreation, housing and amenities, all sharing the water down the river.